industrial accidents, ancient Solving poisoners, crime, poison prevention. Spills. This is Toxic History. Dr. Josh King is uh, one of three medical toxicologists who's also a nephrologist. He trained at Penn State for medical school, and he went to UVA for medicine and for toxicology, and for Johns Hopkins for renal. He's the Poison Center Director of the Maryland uh, Poison Center and the Nephrology Fellowship Program Director. He's going to talk with you today, and I'm really excited to listen in as well. So with that, Josh, I give the mic to you. All right. Thanks so much, Adam, for having me. Thanks, everybody. All right. So I'm, I'm going to go through a, a couple disclaimers here. I, I don't know much about history. I don't know much about any number of, of things, but one of the things I, I do really like are books. So I, I gave a variant of this talk uh, almost a decade ago when I was a fellow at UVA, and many much of this is based on pictures that I took in person of you know, old books, and I'm a really bad photographer. We're going to uh, show a showcase of historical toxicology textbooks, and then we're going to you know, review a few selected tox topics uh, or poisons and see how they've changed over time. And I'll go through a few things. I'm a bad photographer and, and a bad historian, so so please bear in mind that I will undoubtedly say things that are incorrect. Feel free to you know correct me. I will not feel bad. I do like books, and I'm weird enough that I, I found a guy in Seattle who would bind a toxicology textbook by Orphala in a quarter toad skin, your Australian cane toad. So that was awesome. And I'm pretty sure this book that I have at home has arsenic-containing book cloth that's from 1843. I probably have to decontaminate that shelf where it was sitting, but, but we'll get it tested and find out. So let's talk about some toxicology textbooks. You know, early on in the, in the timeline, you, you have all kinds of things. You have textbooks from ancient Greece, ancient China, you know, from the uh, Arabic world. You have textbooks from uh, medieval Europe. But then you move into the more modern era. And by the modern era, I don't mean that modern. I mean, you know, around the, the 1500s or so, when you get to Philippus, uh, Aurelius, Theophrastus, Bombastus, von Hohenheim, whom we also know as Paracelsus, you know, he is one of the founders of, of what we consider modern toxicology. And, and probably his major achievement is that he used observations of nature rather than ancient texts for medical advancement. Because back in the day, it was always stuff like Galen said or Celsus said. And we just, you know, carried forth that whole four humors thing. And Paracelsus said, nope, that's bunk. You should use experimentation. He was not perfect. Sounds like he did, you know, some things in his personal life that were not great. He also was more of an alchemist and a magician, like a magician with a K in it, like the magic with a K folks. He also dabbled in alchemy and astronomy. And the one year that he was an academic professor, he took all of his students' books that I guess would let him, and he burned them in a bonfire, and they did not invite him back the next year. He also said all kinds of humble things like naming himself as better than Celsus. That would be like me naming myself as better than Osler or, or better than Rumac or, you know, what have you. He also said stuff like every little hair on my neck more, knows more than you and all your scribes. And my beard has more experience than your high colleges. So he had the uh, humility thing down. But if you go back into what he said, yeah, it actually made some good, good talk sense. There's a fantastic article, which was actually published by a seminal toxicologist, Dr. William Diekman, back in the 80s, where they took Paracelsus's third defense and went through and translated a bit of it and found that he, he didn't say exactly what we, we quote to him nowadays, but he did say, you know, every things like every cathartic was a poison if not administered in the proper dose. He never said the dose makes the poison. What he said instead was, what is that that is not poison? All things are poison and nothing is without poison. Solely the dose determines that a thing is not a poison. And there are quite a few other you know, things that he wrote, but we'll, we'll leave it at that because otherwise we get into the whole thing where he starts to treat people with tartar emetic, which contains antimony for poisoning and actually makes them worse. There are quite a few books uh, you know, concerning poisoning in medieval times. And one of the earliest available was this weird missive that talked about Henry Robson, who poisoned his wife by you know, putting arsenic into her privic parts. And it's you know, uh, sensational and all that stuff. But this is one of the earliest mentionings of poisoning that I could find. Then you get to herbals. 
And when you get to herbals, you find things that served as pharmacopoeias, you know, because the, the medicines of the day were, you know, herbs. You find as toxicology textbooks, they often missed astrology in there. They often use, you know, plant descriptions that have been passed down over centuries that may be not correct. And we'll start with John Gerard's herbal from 1597. Gerard was a botanist and an herbist. He was a barber surgeon. He probably plagiarized some of his stuff uh, from his folk wisdom, from, you know, so-called cunning folk, your cunning man or cunning woman, which is what you call the witch. And, uh, you know, he had uh, the most popular book on botany. This is a picture of said book. This is from UVA's Rare Books Vault. It was literally in a bank vault, you know, pretty nice. And he wrote things like, Thy sincere and unfeigned friend, John Gerard, as he told you about various plants. Uh, Nicholas Herbal wrote the herbal that still survives to this day, Culpepper's Herbal. You can still buy editions of Culpepper's Herbal. He also wrote something which I think is more entertaining, the English physician, that had this heavy focus on astrology as well as toxicology treatment. It was a, ma a manner which a man may preserve his body in health or cure himself for three pence charge as we went through this astrologo physical discourse. And I love this particular copy because this particular copy was owned by someone who was clearly studying alchemy because they have all of these alchemical and astrologic signs next to each of these compounds, such as nightshade, you know, and, uh, you know, solenum nigrum, of course. And uh, they would write stuff in the back of it, like you and taxes and write things about uh, taxes and this very interesting handwriting um, that to me looks just, just a tad like the Voynich manuscript. I'm just saying, you know, it, it included quite a few other notes as well, which I'm just just showing for fun. And then you start to look and you find things like, you know, this helps the bitings of mad dogs. One of the things you find in toxicology textbooks up through the 19th century is that rabies was considered within the toxicology world. So rabies, which in, in a way it still is, right? We still get, uh, you know, animal bites and, and give recommendations from toxicologists or poison centers uh, about whether someone should be immunized. But, you know, you, you'd see all of these notes about this helps that, wormwood helps this, et cetera. But then we get to a real toxicology textbook. And this is the, the first, you know, kind of real one out there, in my opinion. And this is by, at least in English. And this is by Richard Mead, um, who wrote it in the early uh, 18th century, 1708, your, your second edition, I think 1702 was the first. And this is an actual textbook on treatment of poisoning. And, and Mead, much like Paracelsus, was an advocate of evidence-based medicine and, you know, said, I'm not ashamed to, to alter when I'm wrong and would go through diseases mentioned in the Bible having natural causes at the time. This was a little scandalous. Um, and he treated a bunch of famous folks along the way, too. He also had interest in public health, like many of, of, of us toxicologists do today. You know, he gave recommendations to reduce the spread of plague. He talked about inoculation against smallpox. He, you know, fought to, to uh, create a, a hospital for orphaned kids. So he sounds like a pretty cool guy. Also, he self-experimented with opium, but you know, we'll, we'll give him that. His book is awesome. It's got all of these beautiful plates, you know, these, these plates about, you know, viper envenomation and things like that. He would try to compile case reports and animal studies, hypothesize mechanisms of toxicity. So he would look at studies, this animal experiment where this dog you know, was killed by this poison and you, you know, this um, case of aconitum poisoning. And he said, it seems a lot like monkshood. There we go. The common mischief is a twitching and inflammation of the stomach. Yeah, I, I might not agree with that nowadays, but at least he was looking for common, you know, toxidromes. He talked about animal experiments in envenomation where he, he en enraged a viper to bite a dog on the nose and diligently applied some of the viper fat and the dog was very well the next day. Clearly it worked, it wasn't supportive care at all. And so you've got like things like that in Richard Mead's book. It's a great book. We'll, we'll come back to some things in Mead's book. Next, we come to William or, or Matthew Orfila. And Orfila was a very interesting person. When you're studying for boards, you might read Paul Wax's uh, Goldfrank's chapter, which is fantastic. And you'd read about things like, you know, the, you know uh, Orfila's Trait de Poisson, Orfila was Spanish, but then moved to, to France and basically lived his life in France and published in French. 
and wrote on Treatise on Poisons. That was his landmark text. He also wrote uh, another textbook. Um, that's the one I have at home bound in, in toad skin. And Orfila did a lot of animal experimentation as well, criticized antidotes as useless, also came up with some that are useless. But, but he is probably the person we call one of the parents of modern toxicology rather than historical toxicology, because some of the things that he advocated for we're, we're still kind of doing. Please forgive me for this one in advance. But y'all should know that September 19th is talk like a pirate day. And Orfila was captured by pirates. And I thought that this was a perfect segue to, to talk like a pirate. Yahar. Orfila classified poisons into six groups, much like the toxidromes of today. Only they were things like astringents and corrosives and septics. He would do a lot of medical legal work and was a big fan of the Marsh test. In fact, he was actually criticized for using the Marsh test too extensively. Orphala's treatise on poisons is one of the hallmarks of modern toxicology, but so was Robert Christison's, and you now same name, only in English rather than French. And Christison was one of Orphala's students. Um, he became a professor of medical jurisprudence and presidents of several British and uh, medical societies, and basically uh, focused on chemical analysis of body fluids and, and tissues and, and such. He simplified Orphala's classification scheme and once again did a lot of medical legal stuff. I also had to throw this in there. He was a renal pathologist. Good on you, Robert Christensen. Good on you. Rob Lee Dunglinson was another major uh, toxicology editor. He was easy to get when I was at UVA because they had all of his books there because he was one of the first faculty members there. And he also did a lot of medical legal stuff. And his book, The Treatment of Poisoning and Suspended Animation, was part of his medical jurisprudence textbook, his medical legal textbook. And he talked a lot about, say, Orphala's classification. So you see Orphala's classifications basically coming down the years and eventually became ours. I mean, the whole set of hypnotic thing ultimately comes from our, our you know, changing what Orphala said ever so slightly. Orphala talked about caustic or corrosives. We now call them caustics. He talked about astringents, you know, which, you know, nowadays probably we, we'd call things like, you know, sympathomimetics and, and others. He, they did a lot, you know, with the, with the GI system. And he would talk about toxidromes, you know, violent pain and sense of heat in the stomach and intestines, pulse quick, small and hard, intense heat with unquenchable thirst, as you know, you might see with, with certain toxidromes. They also uh, conflated a lot of infection. This was before the germ theory was necessarily widely accepted. So, you know, septus, sepsis was also considered blood poisoning at the time. Let's go through some individual toxins and toxidromes across the ages. And I think it's it's fitting to start with foxglove because you can find herbals that talk about foxglove for you know, centuries. You know, going back to Gerard's herbal, we talked about the, the foxgloves being bitter, hot and dry. There you go back to the four humors and consume the, the thick toughness of, of the naughty humors. You move on to Culpepper a half a century later, and Culpepper will will talk about these, and he'll talk about how they they have alchemical value and astrological value and all that stuff. Then you get to William Withering, and Withering. If you've not read Withering's book, go read it. I would encourage you to go to the Wellcome Trust. They have a scanned version. It's just amazing. Withering taught, gave a number of case series toward the end of the 18th century. He treated a bunch of patients with the joxin and wrote about their cases. And you can learn a lot about the various toxins that are used as therapeutics back in the day. And Withering talked about digitalis being known since 1542. But he would write about stuff like by blood lettering, by neutral salts, by crystallis of tartar squill. So they used red squill back in the day, occasional purging. He talks a lot about mercurial diuretics in these books, bloodletting. It's just great. You know, he traded kidney stones and other things with foxglove. Again, good for you. And just gave these cases where you have patients with chronic digoxin toxicity, a patient who took high doses of toxglove longer than instructed. I mean, how many times have we heard these stories with many other medications? 
pulse sunk down to 40. Every object appeared green to his eyes, lay in a state approaching syncope and eventually recovered when he stopped taking this, except, you know, Withering put it as, began to emerge out of the extreme danger into which his folly had plunged him. Nausea, weakness of the limbs, feebleness, increased frequency of the pulse, sparks before the eyes, dim vision, etc. Moving from foxglove, we have poppies. So poppies go back to Culpeper and we make the garden poppy heads into a syrup. will produce sleep in the sick and weak and also the not sick and weak. It stays the flux of the belly. It's good to cause constipation and you know, et cetera. It'll help your St. Anthony's fire if that's, that's uh, bothering you. Richard Mead wrote about it that those who take a moderate dose of opium are so transported with the pleasing senses and it, they express themselves in heaven, and though they do not always sleep, they have such a perfect indolence and quiet that no happiness in the world could surpass the charms of this agreeable ecstasy. Here we are, 300 and uh, you know, change years later, and people are still reusing them recreationally. Orphala talked about the opioids in his narcotic schema, but as well as other sedating agents such as hyacyamine with your solanaceous alkaloids. Also decouplers were in there too, like cyanide, because I guess it'll make you sleepy. And attempted to differentiate these from non-toxicologic poisoning, good for you, Warfala. He gave recipes for acetate of morphia. And, and from what I've been able to tell, this is probably heroin, a brownish color from impurities. So there you go. The stronger acids disengage uh, acetic acid, lots of great stuff. Opioids cause a peculiar slumber, set of effect, and excites convulsions. And death from opioids within seven to 12 hours, sometimes death occurs with lunge, gor lunge gorged with blood. And we see that too, right? This is your opioid-induced pulmonary edema or your, uh, your uh, naloxone associated, although, you know, frankly, animal models and patients, you can have it without naloxone. So there you go, opioid-induced pulmonary edema back in the day. The treatment for opioid overdose, eh, probably not what we want to do nowadays. It's all caught emetics. So let's give them copper sulfate and tartar emetic. Tartar emetic, by the way, is antimony potassium tartrate. So copper and antimony will make you barf. Or you can have two strong men drag you up and down for three to 12 hours. That, you know, again, supportive care. A um, little more vigorously than we do nowadays. Let's move to strychnine or the Nux vomica, vomiting nuts. Right. So this was used extensively through the early 20th century. And, and you may recall that in the 1930s, you know, the number one cause of over the counter death were medications that contain strychnine. So we think it not necessary to write of the physical virtues because the danger is great and not to be given urbanly, inwardly. That's what uh, Gerard wrote back in, in uh, 1597, although he said you can give it if you're an ap apothecary. Um, you know, Robert Christensen said you'd have death from respiratory suspension compa compared to water hemlock. Good comparison. Cyanide, eh, maybe not the best comparison. They talked about pennyroyal, which, you know, even back in 1652 was used as an abortifacient and perhaps to help you if you were bitten by a viper, you know, uh, it purges your melancholy humor. So if you have a bit too much of that, so you see both things that, you know, maybe, you know, make sense and maybe things that don't. And it's, it's, uh, it always makes you think of, you know, what, what are we doing now that, that people will, will laugh about in, in a couple hundred years. Uh, water hemlock is talked about the mouth to fall shut that no art could open it. Again, your, your convulsions, frothing at the mouth, uh, et cetera. Dunglinson talked about uh, narcoticoacrid poisons with atropine and daturine, your anticholinergic plants, your digitalis, et cetera, and, and kind of put these all into this, this kind of wastebasket um, uh, category. Henbane was talked about by multiple folks. So your isolated hyacyma, your, your henbane is being poisonous. This was probably Christison talking about how you can use henbane to make yourself giddy and stupid, have your singular union of delirium and coma, which is usually termed tympomania sometimes of the furious kind, so agitated delirium. I, furious delirium is probably a bit more of a fun, although a little pejorative term. Arsenic poisoning was talked about extensively in many of these. This was the era of the, the Marsh test. So Orphala liked it, Dunganson liked it, Christensen liked it. So you heard a lot about arsenic. 
And they were able to describe the toxidrome with experience that they really we don't have nowadays, right? Um, your itching and livid spots. So there's your arsenic spots, great loss of strength and feeling, your peripheral neuropathy, delirium, convulsions, death, absolutely. The Marsh test is talked about extensively in many of these texts. Treatment is all, you know, emetics, emetics, charcoal, and of course, laudanum, because why not? Uh, Christensen wrote about arsenic for a hundred pages and, you know, just wrote extensively about the, the many manifestations and, you know, uh, you know acute and, and chronic arsenic poisoning. I like Christensen because he debunked charcoal for arsenic. He debunked emetics, gastric lavage, and recommended supportive care. So you see kind of this, you know, centuries wide re uh, reliance on decontamination, you know, stemming from Paracelsus to start to give way to supportive care. Mercury is often talked about where you have trembling and paralysis of the limbs. So yeah, we see tremors with mercury, loss of memory, you know, your erythism, what have you, metallic taste and vomiting. You know, they, they kind of conflate uh, inorganic and organic, uh, or sorry, inorganic and elemental mercury toxicity. You hear about various things such as albumin, the, the albumin being the, the whites of an egg as the best treatment for, for mercury poisoning and a bunch of other stuff. And then lastly, we'll talk a bit about envenomations. So your moccasin or rattlesnake bites causing death quickly, 60 hours later, inflammation and abscess, finger bites causing finger mortification. So, you know, kind of scarring and loss of, of function without treatment. Snake bite treatments were widespread and none of them were good. Arsenic, ammonia, cauterize, antiseptics, none of them are great. The European viper may you know, run onto gangrene or the far more terrible effects of the cobra rattlesnake. So the European viper is, is um, you know, does not typically have a severe uh, a a, a envenomation um, as say the rattlesnake, although it's usually worse than the copperhead. And you can swallow venom without any ill effects. So there you go, right? It's a peptide, you digest it. And they figured this out, which is awesome. Marine poisonings, you, you hear about shellfish poisoning, probably allergies to shellfish, your violent asthma. You treat that with ether, of course, as well as paralytic shellfish poisoning. This I'm not gonna focus too much on, but I, I just couldn't resist showing Richard Mead's poisonous gases texture, you know, chapter called Venomous Exhalations from the Earth. And if you are writing a, a chapter on uh, you know, toxic gases, please name your chapter this. Cave gas, you know, all of your ethylene and what have you, volcanoes, hydrogen sulfide, pretty neat. I'm not going to talk about it much because of time. Christensen talked about carbonic acid, which was probably more carbon monoxide than anything else, maybe some CO2. And they, they talked extensively about, say, folks who were found you know, dead with carbon monoxide, the contents of their stomach were analyzed without suspicious you know, substance. A smoke was found from a stove and fuel. One of them had heated a copper vessel so incautiously that you had a low flame. So there you go. Um, there's lots I could talk about. I, I don't want to take up too much time. You know, I, I do want to thank the UVA Rare Books Library as well as the National Library of Medicine that pointed me toward a lot of these you know, uh, references. Uh, Joel Radcliffe was the the fantastic bookbinder who who book you know bound my my book in in um, you know, in toad skin and has since passed on. Um, and thanks, of course, to AACT for having me. Um, that's all I've got.